What commitments is Pitt going to get this weekend? Should college football go to a relegation system? And who's the Pitt version of Marty Gilliard and Scotty Reynolds for other teams? All those questions and more in today's Morning Pitt mailbag right here on YouTube.com slash Pantolaire.com. Welcome to the Friday edition of the Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash Pantholair.com. It's our mailbag edition as we do every Friday or we've been doing every Friday for the last month or two. I don't know how long we've been doing the mailbags, but it's pretty, I think it's working out pretty well. It's, uh, it gives me something uh, a little bit different to do on Fridays. We get to the end of the week and instead of just picking one topic to talk about, we let you provide the topics right there on the message boards at Pantholair.com. You know the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. It's the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, and recruiting. You find everything there at pantholair.com and message boards to interact with hundreds and thousands of other pit fans. And as we head into every Friday uh, during the week, the message boards also give you a chance to influence the topics right here on the morning pit by contributing to the morning pit mailbag. We take those questions on the message board, the between fifth and Forbes premium message board there at pantholair.com. And uh, we solicit questions throughout the week, and then we get to Friday and answer as many of them as we can in our allotted 20, 25 minutes, however long these episodes tend to go. So always look forward to this, and I appreciate everyone who contributed. Listen, make sure you like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You don't want to miss anything that we do here at youtube.com slash pantholaircom. So click the, subs- uh, the, the like buttons over there, the subscribe buttons down there. As long as you're doing those things, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, for sure. You know, you know that I appreciate it. We ask you every day and I thank you in advance if you haven't done it yet. And I thank you already if you uh, if you have. Let's jump into the questions and see what people ha- are asking about. And GM Lind 22 hits the big one right off the bat. Any predictions on commitments from this official visit weekend? We've been talking about the official visits all week long. Um, talking about the recruits uh, who are coming in to visit this weekend and kind of where Pitt stands with them and which guys we're keeping an eye on. They've got, we've confirmed 13 names. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if there's another one or two out there. We've confirmed though a solid Baker's dozen of recruits who are visiting. They arrived yesterday. They'll be staying until tomorrow for a 48 hour official visit, expecting probably some commitments tomorrow, but really go back and forth. It's funny. Jim Hammett and I were talking on the live show on Wednesday night on the podcast, the Panther Lair show, um, about how last year, first official visit weekend, we both remember sort of looking at it and saying, well, it's the first weekend of June and and all these guys have more official visits planned, so they probably won't get many commitments. This might be a quiet weekend, and then they ended up getting like a ton of commitments out of it anyway. And so you look at this weekend's list, you've got 13 guys that we're talking about that are, that are confirmed, and I mean, I think all of them have additional official visits scheduled. Maybe one or two don't have anything scheduled, but they talked about taking other official visits and so I don't know if there are obvious options there are obviously some ones that you would definitely want to get the three four-star guys stand out um you know Elias Rudolph the defensive end and Gabe Williams the uh, linebacker and Nick Marsh the wide receiver if you could get any one of those three that would be huge for Pitt uh for sure um I think Williams in particular is is maybe the I don't know what you want to say, most desirable as a four-star outside linebacker prospect. He's a big-time player. And and linebacker, as I've said all week, is really a position where they need to keep adding players, they need to keep, keep adding good players, and they need to add you know some high-end talent. I like the class la- that, you know, that they signed last year, the class that's coming in as freshmen right now with Rasheem Biles and Jordan Bass and Braylon Lovelace. Lovelace already on campus and impressing the coaches throughout spring camp. Um, but I, they need to build on it uh, because there are some gaps in the scholarship board ahead of that class. I mean, you've got a bunch of seniors and juniors, uh, nothing really, you know, in the, I think in the redshirt freshman, sophomore, and redshirt sophomore classes, they have one linebacker. So you're going to end up with some gaps in there, some holes that you need to keep refilling through recruiting. And they got three guys last year, three guys in this incoming freshman class. I think they need at least two this year and possibly three again and if you could get Gabe Williams as one of those three it would be huge I just don't know if you're going to get him this weekend I think you've got a fighting chance he's got official visits planned to Virginia Tech USC and Nebraska Uh, so it's possible uh, but I I think it's going to be a challenge to get him this weekend you're going to have to really impress him and then hold on as he goes on these other visits Um, as far as 
potential commitments. Uh, we talked about this on Wednesday night with, with Jim Hammett. Mason Lindsay is one, one guy that we're kind of keeping an eye on, an offensive lineman from, um, uh, from DeMatha in Maryland. Uh, obviously a, a very good school with a, a long history of producing D1 talent and NFL talent. Uh, some new additions, you know, Dewan Riggs, a uh, running back from Washington, D.C., is an intriguing guy who's got a lot of interest. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on him. Trevor Jackson, the quarterback from Florida, who we've talked about a lot, that dual-threat quarterback who's got a big arm and can run and make plays with his legs as well. He's got one other official visit scheduled and, and a few others that he's kind of targeting, uh, but I, I could see Pitt convincing him to make the move right now. So he'd be a guy we're keeping an eye on. It's tough to predict names though, because you never know which guy is going to be moved by the spirit and cancel all his future official visits and just commit on the spot and be done with it. It's, it's tough to predict that. I think out of the 13 or 14 or however many they end up having on campus, you're probably looking at five or fewer commitments from this weekend is, is just my guess. Maybe later in the month, they'll land another one or two guys from this weekend. But as far as commitments this weekend, my guess is five or less is probably what you'll see. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's like only three. Um, it's a long month. They've got, what, I think 40 some visits scheduled. They're going to get a lot of guys this month. I, I think they could get, I keep saying anywhere from seven to nine. Um, you know, throughout the month of June, which would put them in about 20 commitments by the end of the month. And so, you know, even if you go by that number, seven to nine, if they get five this weekend, which I think is probably on the high end, that doesn't leave a lot of spots for the rest of the month. You're only going to get a few more guys on top of that. So it, it can be tough to predict. I, I think sometimes there are obvious guys that you say, yeah, th this is probably going to be a commitment. I don't know if there are quite as many obvious guys on this first official visit weekend that uh, is already underway. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, Joey David says, Blake Hinson question. He played two years, redshirted two years, then came to Pitt. If he wanted to do so, um, I switched off the screen there. Uh, if he wanted to do so, does he need a waiver to play his fifth season um, with a COVID year? Well, so I think, um, Joey David, when you're looking at it, Blake Hinson played two years at... Um, at Ole Miss, right? He was at Ole Miss 2018-19, 2019-20. He transferred to Iowa State, sat out, I think, for a medical reason in 2020-21, and then uh, left the team or was dismissed or whatever happened before the 2021-22 season. Even though he didn't play at Iowa State either of those two years, they still count. It's one of these things where once you get to college, your, your clock starts ticking, and, and it doesn't pause. Uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes we have the wrong impression of that, that, oh, it's only the years when you're on a team or the only years when you play. So he could take a red shirt for that first year at Iowa state, which would made him a, a red shirt. Um, so he would have been a junior that year. He would have been a red shirt junior the following year. And he came to Pitt last year as a red shirt senior. It was his fifth year of college basketball, even though he didn't play the previous two. They still count. So this coming season, 23-24, is his COVID year, his super senior year, that extra year of eligibility for being on a roster during the COVID year of 2020-21. So he doesn't need a waiver or anything like that. He's getting that extra year from the NCAA, but it's absolutely his final year i mean given the fact that he missed two years maybe he could try and get a waiver for a seventh year uh i don't i i think they would have to get into the sort of specifics and details of why he didn't play that second year at iowa state one year was a medical reason the second year if, if it was tied to a medical reason maybe you could get a waiver for a seventh year um my get i i would say i'm 99 percent certain that this is blake henson's final year of college basketball his final year at Pitt, and he'll be a super senior this year Pitt lists him on the roster or listed him on the roster last year as a junior um i i didn't entirely understand that i as far as i could tell he was a redshirt senior because those two years at iowa state count if he if if for some reason those two years did not count which would be a shock to me then yeah, he could probably play another year after this as a super senior for that COVID year. I don't think he would need a waiver, but I can't see how those last two years wouldn't count. I think once he's once he got the Ole Miss, the the counter started, the, the clock started ticking, and it'll finish at the end of this season. Uh, L. 
LJ Linhart, I guess is what it says. Uh, any new portal targets for football? Haven't really seen much. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're in touch with a few guys. Uh, we know they have a need for wide receivers. Wouldn't be surprised if they wanted another linebacker to go in that group. Yeah. You know, you obviously really like Bengali Kamara and Solomon DeShield. Shane Simon is good. Brandon George is a, is a quality backup. Uh, you, you're, you're sort of stuck after that. You know, you're, you're talking about guys who haven't really played or haven't really contributed. Uh, like the walk-on, Nick Lappy, or the true freshman, Braylon Lovelace. So the redshirt freshman, Kyle Lewis, who I think would be really good, but was hurt last year and didn't play at all in his true freshman season. So another linebacker, a Tyler Wiltz type, would be a great addition to this uh, this roster. If they could go find another Tyler Wiltz to come in and be a backup, an occasional starter, a rotational player, I mean, that would be huge. I think that would be a great boost to the linebacking core. The number one thing I think they're looking for and should be looking for and need to find is a wide receiver. We haven't really seen them linked to anyone else. I'm sure they're having those conversations, but we haven't really, you know, picked up on anything nothing's really come across the radar at this point like like we said when we talked about the scholarship numbers i think it was earlier this week or last week i i forget the weeks run together for me um we currently have them projected at 82 scholarships for the 2000 for the fall season one of those extra three scholarships the unused scholarships you would think is going to go to the starting punter whether it's caleb junko or jeff york one of those guys is going to be put on scholarship would be a safe assumption which leaves only two spots so you don't have a ton of scholarships to work with. Now, this number could change if guys decide to transfer or if some of the incoming freshmen don't make it. But you're looking at two scholarship spots. Ideally, I think, ideally, you'd find a receiver and you'd put a walk-on on scholarship. Uh, that would probably be, you know, but I wouldn't be surprised if they just end up putting two walk-ons on scholarship in addition to the punter. So really using those final three scholarships on walk-ons. Um, but we've also seen guys appear as as transfer candidates at this point or even later into the summer so we'll keep an eye out and we'll see what see what develops uh zuka 21 says pit fans collectively cringe at the mention of the name scotty reynolds and marty gilliard are there any current or former pit players that are as notorious in another team's lore and, and i like this question because i i don't know you know i the, i don't know all right i mean it would be the first thing i would say I think what's interesting is sort of the, the context of the question. It can't just be somebody who did well against their team. Like Duke fans are not sitting around cursing the name Valique Carter because he killed them two years in a row. You know, they're, they're not like, oh, God, Valik Carter, I hate that guy. I, I mean, it was just a random regular season game, you know, it, it, an important one in 2018. It was, it was a big part of their turnaround uh, to end up winning the Coastal Division that year. And he made the game when he scored the game when he touched down a year later in 2019 down at Duke. But those games were just midseason games, regular season games. They didn't really have a lot riding on it. Not the way the Marty Gilliard Cincinnati game in 2009 or the Scotty Reynolds, uh, you know, Elite Eight game in 2009. Those games had something riding on them. And so the plays that those guys made carries extra frustration for Pitt fans. I got to think that Wake Forest fans don't feel good about Kenny Pickett. Um, and, and, and that was the first one that came to mind for me. Uh, partially, it just, I mean, you know, the slide play, you know, largely. They, they should be cursing, like, Eric Hallett and A.J. Woods and those guys. But, I mean, the Kenny Pickett slide play is one, you know, and all the defensive linemen who knocked, you know, knocked the crap out of Sam Hartman all game. But the slide play is probably the one that irks Wake Forest fans the most. And so Kenny Pickett probably still bugs people wake forest fans i would think if they're paying attention to football or if they're thinking about football which may not be a regular occurrence that probably is the game that bugs them or the player that bugs them the most i wondered if that was too notorious a player i mean you were talking about the quarterback a heisman trophy fan finalist a first round draft pick but you know scotty you know scotty reynolds was a pretty prominent player on that villanova team marty gilliard a little less so on the cincinnati team but it's still like it's not like he was some random guy that came out of nowhere and killed pitt in a in a crucial game uh so maybe kenny pickett for the wake forest game i was trying to think of some others a, a game where a guy just absolutely owned another team um and, and there's not a lot i you know if i was a west virginia fan i would still be really mad about pat bostick 
Pat Bostic scored a rushing touchdown in that game. You lost your opportunity to go to the national championship because Pat Bostic scored a rushing touchdown. Pitt's only touchdown in that game did not come from, uh, you know, LaShawn McCoy. It didn't come from, you know, anybody like that. It came from Pat Bostic scoring a rushing touchdown, diving into the end zone, and that kept you out of the national championship game. That would burn me if I was a West Virginia fan. Um, more recently, West Virginia fans probably don't feel great about MJ Devonshire. Uh, I would think, uh, you know, again, just a regular season game, not a lot riding on it. Not like the 13 to nine game or some of these other games we're talking about. Um, but I, I got to think they don't, although they might be more mad about Neil Brown and, and, you know, you know, those guys that, that might bother them a little bit more than, than Devonshire himself. So I don't know if there's any good options. If you, if, if you could think of one, let me know. I, I'd like to hear it in the comments. Uh, or if you have fans of other teams, who who do they complain about? Who bugs them the most? I'd be curious to hear what their take is. Uh, let's scroll down here. Uh, Berg B says, how many do you think they'll take at defensive end and defensive tackle? If Ty Uhas is, project, project, is believed to project as a D tackle, that makes three with Uhas, Francis Brew, and Jasir Whittington, and one D end in Zach Crothers. It, that would seem to be enough at D tackle, but would they take two more ends? Possibly three if that number included in no matter what, like Elias Rudolph. Um, so yeah, that's going to be an interesting situation. Uh, like you mentioned, they got four defensive linemen committed right now. Uh, Ty Uhas, uh, defensive end from Central Catholic, potentially could move inside to tackle. I'm not entirely convinced that he will, but he potentially could. His versatility, though, probably gives them flexibility in whether they take two more ends or one more tackle or potentially both and end up signing like six or seven defensive linemen as good as they've been along the defensive line and as well as they've recruited the position they could use an influx of numbers they haven't gotten a ton of numbers the last few years i think the last two years they've signed one defensive tackle in each of the classes sean fitzsimmons um two years ago and Isaiah Neal this past year coming as, as a freshman now. So they definitely could use a boost there, even if it means taking three plus a guy like Uhas who could potentially move inside to tackle. Uh, I could see them doing that. And then they they're in on some really good D end prospects. And uh, you know, I, I can't see them. I, I think they're, they're probably narrowing down the guys that they would take. I don't think they would take all of the targets, even all of the guys who were taking visits this month or were scheduled to take visits this month. But I think they would take, they, they have a select group. I think they would take a commitment from, um, it's probably just a handful of guys. I could see them taking as many as two more if the right guys want to commit. So I, I think it's a shifting number. And I think even if you were to get Charlie Partridge in a room, you say, Charlie, how many more defensive linemen are you going to take? He would say, well, depends on who wants to commit. You know, you, you you tend to have these like lines, you know, you say, we're only going to take two of this. We're only going to take two of that. We're only going to take two running backs. We're only going to take three linebackers. But if the right guy wants to commit, now there's limits. I mean, ultimately you are going to reach a ceiling, but if the right guy wants to commit, you find a way to make the numbers work rather than turn away a player who can really help you win games and win the ACC. Um, Pitman 2003 said, is it rivals policy that you and Jim aren't allowed to be seen as pit fans because you guys hide it? Well, um, uh, is it rivals policy that we're not allowed to be seen as pit fans? I no, but there is a certain expectation written into contracts of presenting objectivity. I mean, it, you know, we're, we're discouraged from wearing a pit shirt to a pit game, but the reality is I, I think rivals as a company has an expectation of objective reporting you know and and i think the expectation for any reporter who goes into the press box i, I think there are certain expectations of any reporter who goes into the press box um your decorum your dress you know what what you wear yeah you're not going to walk in there with a tony dorsett jersey on or you shouldn't at least um that's just not proper press box decorum. There's an announcement before every game, uh, you know, attention media on, on behalf of the football writers association of America, university of Pittsburgh welcomes you to Acroshore stadium. And, uh, you know, a reminder that there's no cheerleading in the press box or no cheering in the press box. And, uh, you know, violators will be dealt with, uh, potentially removed from the whatever, but it's no cheering in the press box. And sometimes that, uh, gets, 
you know, the, 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 the limits of that get pushed a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I think when there's something non sports happening, uh, you know, um, you, you know, you know, what gets a cheer out of the press box. Actually, I'll tell you, you know, what gets a cheer out of the press box when they do one of those things on the court or on the field where, there's a kid out there and they're out there being recognized like a young kid and they're out there uh, for everyone to say hello for them because their mom or their dad is serving overseas and they haven't seen him in two years and all that stuff. And then the mom or dad walks out behind them and surprises them. That usually gets a cheer out of the press box. But for the most part, there's an expectation of, you know, a certain dignified behavior a certain level of decorum and i know you're laughing because you're thinking about sports journalists in pittsburgh and saying there's no decorum and no dignified behavior and i understand that but in terms of objectivity and presenting objectivity there is that expectation and i think that carries over to rivals and to be quite honest i mean this is a battle look i've been doing this job for a long time started here in 2005 okay and when i started sites like i mean the rivals network had a certain reputation as fan sites, fanboy sites. Uh, you know, they, they, they were fan sites. They were run by fans for fans and the people who ran them acted like fans. They, they, you know, they conducted themselves, uh, without objectivity, um, in, in their reporting. And it took a long time and a lot of work to break that perception and break that reputation and, and break that stereotype of rival sites all being fan sites that no we are an objective news source it's reporting on the teams and reporting on recruiting because you should be i mean you don't want i'm going off on a tangent here but i mean the reality is you know you don't want people who are getting on the phone with recruits interviewing recruits also pumping up the schools you know, I, I think you know you want an objective take uh, from the recruit on what he thinks of the school. You don't want me sitting there saying, "Hey, you know, uh, you um, uh, hey, uh, what would it be? Defensive tackle recruit. Hey, you know, uh, want to know what what do you think about Pitt? Oh, okay. Well, you know they had a first round draft pick this year. You know, Aaron Donald went there. I mean, that's pretty good, right? That's a pretty good situation for you, isn't it? Or you know. I don't think you want that. Coaches don't want that. College coaches want to control the message themselves. They don't want people like me out there trying to share the message for or spread the message for them. So it, it's just something you want to shy away from. But that's what it was. You know, that's what it was in the early 2000s. And, and I think it, it faded over the years. I think there's probably still pockets of it now. Um, you know, still you know, a lot of guys, probably guys that are held over from those early days who never really shifted into more of an objective form of coverage. Um, so, you know, you know, your question about hiding pit fandom or this or that. No, I mean, it's, it's a job. We're out here doing a job and we're very fortunate to do this job, a very lucky job and a job. Sometimes I have to put in quote marks because I work from home. And when I leave the house, it's to go to games or press conferences, uh, but it is still a job and, and you want to treat it as respectfully and professionally as possible. So, um, does rivals stipulate it? No, but they do stipulate that you have a certain objectivity in your reporting and you don't want to appear to be influencing the recruiting process. Um, you don't want to be a reporter who says, well, I, I had this impact. I helped them get this guy or I did this or I did that. You, you don't want that. You want to stay away from that. And I think Jim and I do a pretty good job of it. I'd like to think. All right, last one. Ziv9695 says, Hi, Chris. Do you have any thoughts on what it would be like if college football moved to a promotion relegation format? 32 teams in each tier. If bottom four get rele relegated, let the original rankings be based off of whatever because from then on it would be decided on the field. Pitt probably opens in tier two but has a chance to play their way into the top tier. I, 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 I don't see a system like that ever forming. Um... I don't for a number of reasons because you would need to, to get a system like that formed if you're going to have you know all 65 power five teams participate that means that you're going to have 23 of them that are going to immediately not be in the money <laughs> you know they're, they're going to be they're going to be dropped and they're presumably i would think you would get less money if you get relegated i don't know if that's how it works in uh you know football but um presumably if you had this system in college football you would you would get less money and nobody's going to vote for themselves to get less money so you run into a problem number one there uh you you know people talk continuously about the possibility of a big two of the sec and big 10 
breaking off and doing their own thing. That's probably more likely than an actual relegation and promotion system. And even if they did that, those conferences aren't going to vote. You know, if the Big Ten and SEC said, all right, guys, we're going to break off unless you agree to a relegation promotion. The only way we'll let you stay with us is if you all agree to a relegation promotion system. I don't think they would do that because they want to bring in the teams that they want to invite. They don't want to just take whoever wins the most games out of those other 25 teams that don't make the cut. Um, they want to invite in the teams that will help them make even more money. A- any of these things that, that you look at, any of these you know possible scenarios in college sports, or oh, could they do this or would they do that, always start with the question of what's going to make people more money. That's all it's going to come down to. Um, e- even more than the question of what's going to avoid people losing money. What will make the most money? I don't know if a relegation promotion system would do it. You know, I, I think probably the potential for cash grabs is greater with the Big Ten and SEC just sort of doing their own thing. They could get more money that way. And then if they want to invite some other teams, they can. But it doesn't necessarily have to be some sort of um, built in relegation or promotion. So I, I'd have a hard time seeing that. I, I think once you get this far into a sports history, it's hard to then break into that format and have that considerable of a change, that drastic of a change. But that's uh, that's just me. What do I know, right? I'll tell you what I know. I know it's the weekend, all right? I hope you've had a great week, and I appreciate you tuning into all these Morning Pit episodes this week. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody who watched the podcast on Wednesday night or since then. Uh, I appreciate uh, yeah, everybody who watches. It's been it's been a fun week. We've had a lot of good things to talk about, and I know Monday is going to have a ton to talk about as we come out of the official visit weekend, see where Pitt stands with the recruits who visited this weekend. If you want to get updates and stay uh, current on everything going on with the official visit weekend, Keep it locked right there. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com, the most comprehensive source of Pitt sports news on the internet. Football, basketball, and recruiting. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. Also, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We appreciate that. And otherwise, have a great Friday. Enjoy your weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday for the Morning Pit right here on YouTube.com slash